Our, our next speaker is Dr. Corey Slovis, and uh, again, another uh, one of those people that we consider legendary in emergency medicine. Uh, Corey has been practicing emergency medicine for quite some time. I won't say how long, but he's the founding chairman of the Department of Emergency Medicine at Vanderbilt and is, is now uh, emeritus chairman. Um, at Vanderbilt. He's also still serving as medical director for the Nashville Fire Department and Nashville's International Airport. He's completed residencies in internal medicine and emergency medicine, boarded in both, and also boarded in emergency medicine services. And he's received just about every possible teaching award in emergency medicine you can imagine. Uh, ASEPS, Judith Tintinelli, Outstanding Contribution to Education Award, the American College of Emergency Physicians Speaker of the Award, the Peter Rosen Award from a, a master clinical teacher by the Dean at Vanderbilt and has won numerous awards locally at Vanderbilt. And, and of course, now he has two teaching awards that are named after him, the Vanderbilt Corey Slovis Excellence in Teaching Award and the Major Metropolitan EMS Medical Directors Consortium. Christian Corey M. Slovis Award for Excellence in Education, uh, really a master clinician and a master educator. And uh, we're, we're so honored and happy to have him joining us today. And uh, one of Corey's particular areas of interest is emergency cardiology. And so he's going to be spending a little bit of time talking about a topic that um, he refers to as the angry ventricle. So I'm curious to hear what that's all about. So Corey, thank you for joining us and please take it away. Oh, Amal, um, thank you for such a wonderful introduction. I, I, I worry that after hearing all those things about me, which cost me a lot of money, I might add, it's only downhill from here. Uh, before I begin, I really want to extend a very warm welcome to the European uh, Cricket Society. These are folks who have really supported this conference and have really been a, a large part of many of the things that some of us do. So on that note, let me begin this is our job as physicians, nurses, paramedics, anyone in healthcare, secure the ABCs. And so I want to talk about that as it relates to the angry ventricle. I believe there are five causes, five steps, five reasons. And so many of my slides will have five things on them. If you have someone with a ventricular arrhythmia, your first thought is, is there something reversible? If we look at the vital signs, are they hypoxic? Are they hypothermic? Are they ischemic? Are they infarcting? What about prolonged QT, especially due to hypo-K, hypomag, but anything that prolongs the QT? In really sick people, is there a profound pH imbalance? And it turns out alkalosis above 7.55 or 7.6 really is an arrhythmogenic uh, milieu. And finally, hypersympathetic states, including lots of epinephrine and along with toxins. I am not going to spend a lot of time on this. This is torsades. I believe in French, it's called torsades, the points. Uh, but this twisting of points, VTAC, uh, which is a cross between VFib and VTAC in a undulating manner. If the person is relatively stable, magnesium, two grams. If they're not, shock it and then give the mag. Uh, Torsades is an exciting rhythm, but I, I don't want to spend much time on it. This is what I want to talk about. Ventricular fibrillation. To see it is to shock it, but the shock might not work or there might be different ways to give it. These are the five ways to treat a ventricular, a treating VTAC or VFib. Pulses VTAC. If they don't respond to that first or second shock, antiarrhythmics, switching the positions of the pads, and I'll talk about that, double sequential defibrillation, beta blockade, or should they get ECLS, get ECMO, PCI, and, and I'll, I'll close with a discussion of that and its potential value. These are three definitions that I think are important to know and to be able to differentiate. Refractory VF or shock-resistant VF is ventricular fibrillation after three shocks. Electrical storm is repetitive ventricular fibrillation over time. 
someone in the ED or ICU or CCU who keeps going into this and has a period of stability and then goes right back into it. And then incessant BT is repetitive ventricular tachycardia after an ICD shock. If you have someone in electrical storm, they respond and then they go right back into it or 5, 10, 15 minutes later, be thinking about, is this ischemia infarction? Do they need to go to the lab? What's their pH? Are they in failure and that's increasing their ischemia? Have they stopped their antiarrhythmics or have they recently had a pacer insertion? To treat it, find the trigger and obviously treat it. Begin standard antiarrhythmics, amio or lidocaine, and we'll talk about both of them. Get help. Add more antiarrhythmics, and I'll be talking about beta blockade shortly. And if that doesn't work, there are a number of other things left to you or someone. And that even includes uh, left stellate ganglion block, which, uh, although it's not well studied, ha has worked in some selective cases. There's no best way to treat it. And as I now talk about all the different things you can do for BFib, you apply them. So first, and this study appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine, and it's really looking at which is better, amio or lidocaine, and is it possible that it's placebo? I grew up believing lidocaine was what you gave. We used to give it prophylactically. Then we stopped giving it prophylactically. Then it was re replaced by the miracle drug Bertillium, which is then replaced by the miracle drug amiodarone. But the more you look at these medications, the less there is to see, actually. This study from 10 different uh, station outcomes consortium, uh, randomized people to one of these three things, amio, lidocaine, or placebo. And take a look at survival. There's not a statistically significant difference. There's a trend towards amio and lidocaine, and placebo isn't quite as good, but the differences are minuscule. Keep in mind that we've based our therapy on shock, epi, and relying on antiarrhythmics, when in fact, maybe they don't do that much. And here's some of the data. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. The closest statistical significance, without being significant, is amio versus placebo was 3.2% better. Now, these patients got, this is an outpatient study, they got their medication 10 to 20 minutes into this, some even longer. If amio was given to a witnessed arrest, there was a significantly statistic difference in those 154 patients. So maybe antiarrhythmics acutely have real value. But I'll tell you, the, this is the largest meta-analysis looking at the effectiveness. It's a, a, actually a systemic, systematic review, 1,200 patients, amio versus placebo, 987 amio versus lidocaine. And then you can see a huge number of people with lidocaine versus placebo. Let me tell you what it shows. Magnesium works for torsades. Other than that, it is really hard to show that antiarrhythmics, am uh, amiodarone and lidocaine make any difference at all. There's no clear evidence that either really make a difference. Now, I'm somewhat anti-epinephrine. Some of my best friends use it. They love it. I just want to give you three conclusions from the only large double-blind placebo-controlled trial. 8,000 patients. These are the three conclusions. Epinephrine in out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, including VF, improves ROSC and the likelihood for discharge. That's positive. More nuanced is epinephrine doesn't improve neurologically intact survival. But this is the problem with epi, especially in VFib. Epinephrine just increases the likelihood of being neurologically devastated. Many more neurologically devastated but alive patients who got epi versus not. And in other studies, the more epi you got in VFib, the worse you did. My bias 
one dose of epinephrine after the second shock, <clears throat> and that's it. That is my belief. That is what I would do if a loved one arrested. And it may be in the future, we just don't give epi at all. The more epi you give in BFib, the worse the patient will do. All right. So what else can we try besides standard antiarrhythmics? We can try double sequential defibrillation. First case report. Uh, this is from uh, WashU. Uh, this patient had been shocked multiple times. He had run into a, a basketball uh, post, a basketball net post, uh, and he got double sequential defibrillation, which it, and, and then left the hospital the next day. Here you can see uh, the early way it was done, anterior or posterior. Here you can see how some people are doing it now with two defibrillators. You fire them somewhat sequentially. Uh, you try to do it together, but you're providing a sequential shock. Uh, the studies, unfortunately, don't show what the best way to do it is. V-fib and double sequential seem like a win-win. But when you look at studies, this is matched people out of San Antonio, 64 with double sequential, 64 not. Same downtime, same number of epi, same number of witnessed. Those colors are correct. Standard is better. And the author said, you know, maybe double sequential, and they're big advocates. Maybe it's not right. The largest study, 310 patients, also out of uh, this one out of Houston. Look at this. Standard was better. And in the meta-analysis, couldn't find any evidence to support double sequential. So this is what I think. It's not more effective. It can damage the defibrillator, but it is absolutely one hell of a crowd pleaser. People love seeing this. Before you close the door on double sequential, this is a very important paper. It has changed my practice. Double sequential versus stantier anterolateral versus switching to anteroposterior after three shocks, refractory VF, crossover design out of our friends in Canada. They do great work, as Dr. Steele always demonstrates. Take a look at this. As far as conversion, AP and double sequential were better than standard. As far as ROSC, look at the difference. 30% difference. More. And when you look on ROSC on arrival, once again, AP and double sequential, better than standard. So this is my bias. I think we should switch. If you're doing anterolateral, you don't need to go to double sequential at the present time, but just go ahead and switch the pads. It is a great way. If you have an anterolateral, go anteroposteral. If you have an anteroposteral, go anterolateral. And my bias right now is that I love anteroposteral. Uh, it's interesting when defibrillation first began, that's how they did it. It's just so much easier to do anterolateral. What about beta blockers? They unfortunately are not really addressed well in the current guidelines that just came out. And they say there's just not enough evidence for or against. This one study uh, shows, however, out of Hennepin, an early study in 2014, that when you looked at patients that had shock-resistant VF, who had been shocked three times, if, and, and who had gotten antiarrhythmics, these people uh, had all gotten amiodarone. Take a look. Sustained ROSC and the most important currency, good neuro, five times as effective. This is a non, not well-controlled trial. This is an observational study. And so the Annals of Emergency Medicine asked, does beta blockade make a difference? And before I tell you whether it does or doesn't, they relied on this study. This is a systematic review and meta-analysis of beta blockade. The use of Esmolol uh, in, in two of the three, the third one had different beta blockers. It's not randomized or blinded. These are the 115 patients. 
Beta blockers sustain ROSC better. Beta blockers for hospital discharge, beta blockers better. This is the currency. Three times the number of good neuro on discharge in refractory VF using beta blockade. Very impressive. So I love this conclusion. It, beta blockers may be associated with improved rates of spontaneous circulation and discharge with favorable neurologic outcome in patients with refractory ventricular fibrillation or pulseless VTAC. Giddy up. I love beta blockers in VF. They're also good for performance anxiety. So what do I think about antiarrhythmics? We have switched from amio to lidocaine in our outpatient setting. It's easier to give. I don't know how much difference it makes, perhaps none. If they're given acutely, they, they, they do seem to work better than placebo. But I think beta blockers and shock-resistant VF is the way to go. I think anteroposteral pads are the way to go. And maybe double sequential, you don't have much to lose. The final thing I want to talk about is ECMO. And this is a very, very interesting new therapy as far as refractory VF. This first article out of Minneapolis looked at whether ECMO could make a difference. They transported 100 patients with VF or pulses VTAC who had had three shocks and amio. They transported them with mechanical CPR going, and they found almost half of them left the hospital neurologically intact. Keep in mind that when you take all comers in cardiac arrest, uh, about 6% leave the hospital uh, and less than half have good neuro. If you look just at VF, depending on the city, or if you're in Seattle, about half. So this trial is a randomized phase two NIH open label trial done with the same group based on their near miraculous results in their uh, exploratory study. The study was stopped early. So there are only 30 patients. 15 were transported and got standard ACLS in the emergency department. The other 15 out of the 30 got ECMO facilitated resuscitation. Mechanical CPR rushed to the cath lab with mechanical CPR, put on ECMO, then PCI. All the patients had shock-resistant VF. This requires that they be transported in under 30 minutes from the time of the arrest. They got mechanical CPR. This is only adult, only presumed cardiac-induced cardiac arrest. Survival to discharge, 7% with standard ACLS, one out of the 15. 41% or six out of the 14 left the hospital getting ECLS, ECMO, PCI assisted CPR. Now, how dramatic the results are appears when you look at longer term survival. And so I want to show the Rankin scores, the modified Rankin scores. And for those of you that don't use modified Rankin, when you look at people, what you want to do is be zero, one, or two. Zero, no deficit. One, it takes a neurologist to see the deficit. Two, you could see the deficit, but the person can feed him or herself, can toilet, can dress, can perform the activities of normal daily living. Unfortunately, at the time of discharge, these people needed assistance that survived. But look at three months. There are no survivors with standard ACLS. And now the modified Rankin score is two. Yes, they have some deficit, but they are self-sufficient. And then this is the money slide for me. Obviously, if there are no survivors at three months, there can't be any survivors at six months, or it's a very unusual study for standard ACLS. But look at the ECMO group. 
1.3 modified Rankin. Many of them had very minimal deficits. This is a revolutionary therapy. And so right patient, right medical center, you obviously have to have the cath lab and ECMO team ready, but this shows clear superiority. And I believe this is the first real advance in V therapy, in ventricular fibrillation therapy since defibrillation. Now you, you got to be careful though. And I, I just want to do this one final study before I summarize. This just came out. It appears in the journal Resuscitation. And this is in Oslo, Norway. This is an ECMO center. And they went ahead and looked at their results. Only 3 to 4% of their out-of-hospital cardiac arrests uh, were eCPR candidates. But they looked at 30-day survival and neuro outcome. They did it exactly like the Minneapolis study. And they went ahead and transported shock-resistant VF after 10 minutes of uh, ACLS. Most of the patients had bystander CPR. And many of these patients had ALS uh, in under 10 minutes. They all were transported with mechanical CPR It's required. When you look at the data, however, this is before they did ECLS and after. There is better survival without ECLS in Oslo, Norway, in this one study. And they only had one of 14 patients survive that was neurologically intact. One out of 14. That is in contradistinction to the prior study where you had a dramatic improvement in who left neurologically intact. So these are really disappointing results. It's not a randomized trial. They only had one patient who survived, and, and that, that's really questionable. So let me summarize about what I think about angry ventricles. One, don't make ventricles angry. Be nice to ventricles. That's one of my messages. But what else? Reverse hypoxia or gently rewarm. Be sure you're not dealing with ischemia and infarction. Those people got to, have got to have their arteries open. Prolonged QT, especially above 500 milliseconds, predisposes to, to torsades and ventricular arrhythmias. You don't need to get an arterial blood gas in most patients. But if you have a hypotensive, critically ill patient, Take a look at their pH. And finally, including epinephrine, hypersympathetic states, cocaine, et cetera, cause ventricular arrhythmias and make ventricles angry. How do you treat VFVT? How do you treat an angry ventricle? Shock. To see it is to shock it. VFib, DFib. After the second shock, not before, epinephrine, one dose, one milligram in the adult, 10 cc's of one to 10,000. Switch the pad position. I don't do double sequential defibrillation, but I do beta blockade if they are still in BF. And if you have the right hospital, the right lab ready to go, can they go to the cath lab? And if you're going to do this from the field, it has got to be a pre-established protocol. You can't do it on the fly. It has been a privilege talking with you. Uh, I welcome questions. I would only ask that you ask me questions that I either can quote an article or know the answer. Well, thanks so much. Sorry. That was really great. Uh, we've got, you finished a bit early, which opens you up to some time for questions. Which is you actually... know, when I did this talk in real life, in practice, I knew I had to speed it up because it was always too long. So, of course, in front of a large audience, I go too fast and it's too short. It's the story of my life. <laughs> Just not enough.
at the right time. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, we won't get into that, but uh, but thanks so much. Um, I'm going to start the questions off and then hand things over to Sarah and Cheyenne for a handful of the other questions. Just real quick, um, amongst the things you talked about, uh, dual sequential defibrillation, your use of epi, and uh, the beta blockers and the ECLS. Is there is there anything different in the COVID era that that we need to reconsider based on what you've said, or are you pretty much you still considering all four of those things that you mentioned even now? So some of the centers that have been doing ECLS during COVID have really cut back or stopped uh, only because uh, having mechanical ventilation, having mechanical CPR being in a closed box, transporting many more patients than they might uh, had increased the risk. Some of those centers are starting. But I, I think as, and maybe some of you have seen this, we've had real trouble getting all of our medics and EMTs uh, immunized. Uh, they, they have great resistance. And, and so it, it's always a problem. Yeah. Cheyenne and Sarah? Thank you, Dr. Slovis. Um, the first question that came through was uh, regarding the dual sequential defibrillation. In the papers that compared it to the standard defibrillation, did they specify the positioning of the dual sequential defib? So the early studies used uh, anterior lateral and anterior posterior. Uh, the most recent study didn't specify all of them, but I really think that you should not just do anterolateral and more anterolateral. I, I know it's, it's a double sequential, but I really think changing the vector of the shock dramatically is more likely to be effective. Fantastic. So next question is from Andy Cartier, I believe. Um, that's how you pronounce it. He says, I would love to hear Dr. Slovis's thoughts on feasibility of community-based ECMO to allow interfacility transfer to a PCI-capable facility for refractory VFib patients. Is the juice worth the squeeze? First, great question. There are very few ECMO candidates. And as you see in Minneapolis, you have to have a center close by, <clears throat> you cannot be greater than 60 minutes from the arrest till being in the ECMO lab. And so time really becomes a big barrier here. And doing it in the community, as long as it's a relatively discreet community and you have a hospital, <clears throat> so very sorry, that you can get to quickly, it's a possibility. My belief is if you're gonna do something in your community to really make a difference, teach CPR, have more AEDs, get your police force to carry AEDs, stress treating hypertension and hyperlipidemia that we want a healthy community. I think ECMO and ECLS is wonderful. It is a huge resource drain and I think, you know, sometimes you got to prioritize. When there are 30 people in the waiting room, you don't take them one by one based on their time of arrival. I think ECMO is great, but I think there's a lot more low-hanging fruit at close to $0 charge. Thank you, Dr. Slovis. And uh, your endorsement of beta blockers caused quite a buzz in the chat. A few questions regarding those. Um, we would like to know the dose for Esmolol in pulseless VTAC and VFib. And if you do not have Esmolol available, are you grabbing for another beta blocker instead? And so in one of those three studies, they used Indorel. Beta blockers are beta blockers. And we love Esmolol because it's easy on, easy off. But I'll tell you, uh, there was some very early data uh, in the late 80s using just IV push Indorel, a milligram. The dose of Esmolol is as follows. If you're a scientist or in, you're in an academic practice, it's 500 micrograms per kg IV push and then 50 mics 
per kilogram per minute. However, I can't remember that. This is what I know. Estimated patient weight divided by two. It's a 60 kilogram person, 30. And then whatever you give, put a decimal point in, three milligrams a minute. So one half weight in kilos per minute. And be aware that it may take a few minutes to work. It's not just you push it and they're out. Also, the next question is from... Go ahead. Forgive me if I'm not pronouncing this correctly. Rogelio Lopez. Dr. Slovis, do you have a protocol for... Sarah, your voice has cut out. You're on mute. For giving beta block fire department. Could I ask you to repeat the question? You are muted. Yes, absolutely. Sorry about that. So this question is from oh, Regilio Lopez. Um, do you have a protocol for giving beta blockers in cardiac arrest for your fire department? What about withholding epinephrine in cardiac arrest? So... We do not currently use beta blockers on our EMS unit. Uh, I'm very much in the midst of uh, relooking at whether we should add it. This is what I think, think about epinephrine. The more epinephrine you give in any rhythm, the more likely you are to get a rhythm back, but not a brain back. My belief is it is an incumbent upon all of us who are involved in EMS is to have a termination of resuscitation protocol. Uh, Lori Morrison, someone who Ian Steele has mentored and works with, uh, has said that if you look at patients who don't have a witness to rest, who don't have a shockable rhythm, and uh, they don't ever regain circulation, then maybe those people will never survive. That's been modified a little bit. The French, led by Jabra, say after two doses of epi. So this is what I believe. If my wife arrested and it had been more than 10 minutes of CPR and she had a non-shockable rhythm and she'd gotten three doses of epi, three minutes apart, then unless, if she was in asystole, it's time to stop. If she was in slow PEA, it would be time to stop. The only people I think we should continue CPR past 10 to 15 minutes are people that have V-fib arrests. And in those people, talking about some of the advanced therapies I've just mentioned, most especially in the field, switching AL to AP positioning. But the more epinephrine you give, the more people we're going to get back, the more people that will never function correctly. And when I say correctly, that's a bad word, who will never be neurologically intact enough to live a meaningful life. Thank you. And last uh, question, um, and we'll save the rest for the Q&A session, is do you have any thoughts on hands-on defibrillation with an appropriate insulating barrier in refractory VFib? Oh, this is such a great question. I think hands-on defibrillation is a crowd pleaser that works, that does not interrupt CPR. Uh, the original study uh, done uh, at Emory with Paul Walter and his colleagues, uh, they had their hands on there. Uh, other studies have showed minimal current leak. I don't know whether you need an insulated barrier or two pairs of gloves, but it is coming and it is fun. And also, if you're a little bit depressed, uh, if your hands are on, you're most likely to feel better and save a patient. <laughs> All right, Corey, thanks so much. We got we got a little uh, emergency psychiatry in there as well. I always appreciate the amount of teaching that you can provide. Uh, and I hate to say it, but sometimes it goes beyond your typical five points. There's a lot. <laughs> so thanks. We'll be back with more questions uh, at the Q&A session.